All right, and welcome to DinoFest, and thank you for joining for us our, uh, our first Digging Deeper discussion today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about LA Underwater. We're going to take a deep dive into what lies beneath the surface of Los Angeles. Uh, and I'd like to introduce our speakers and our moderator here. So we have uh, Alan Zidnack, who is our senior preparator of vertebrate paleontology. Alan received his training in fossil preparation and archival specimen housing at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Here at NHM, he's helped redesign and renovate the museum's fossil prep lab, and he's an active member of the greater paleontological community, teaching workshops at professional meetings, such as the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. Next, we have Dr. Austin Hendy, who's our assistant curator of invertebrate paleontology. After obtaining his doctorate at the University of Cincinnati, go Bearcats, Austin was a postdoc fellow at Yale University, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institution, and the Florida Museum of Natural History. As an author on numerous scientific papers, he's conducted research in many parts of the world, but especially tropical South America. There, he studies the biodiversity, biogeography, and paleoecology of Cenozoic mollusk faunas. Then we have Dr. Jorge Elise Guarde. He's the Associate Curator of Marine Mammals, Mammalogy, and Vertebrate Paleontology. Jorge has a PhD from Howard University, HU, right? uh, where he studied the morphology, systematics, and paleobiology of fossil sirenians and cetaceans. And after receiving his doctorate in 2012, uh, Jorge held a postdoc associate position at the Florida Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, and at California State University Fullerton before coming here and joining us as an assistant curator of marine mammals. Uh, Jorge's appointment involves territorial responsibility for both our fossil and extant marine mammal collections. And then finally, we have our moderator here, uh, Daniel uh, Caballero, our junior video content creator, marketing and communications. And Daniel has worked as a museum ed educator since 2014, bringing his passion for the natural world, as well as first-hand paleontological and collections experience to countless guests. He has brought that same passion to the digital world, now creating video content for the Natural History Museum and the Brea Carpet. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming our spot speaker and our moderators. Oh, nice moonlighting now. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for finding us as well. How are you all enjoying Dynafest today? <laughs> Uh, this is the first talk of, or first Digging Deeper panel for DinoFest. Uh, unfortunately, we will not be talking about dinosaurs today. Can everybody say aww? Aww. All right. Uh, but we will be talking about something uh, just as interesting and, and a little closer to home, actually. Today, we, we're going to go ahead and talk about that fantastic new exhibit by NHMLA that reads on the first floor next to the, uh, next to the current Los Angeles exhibit. Los Angeles Underwater, also known as LA Underwater, if you guys you know, like to abbreviate things. Now, how many of you have gone to go see the exhibit by a show of hands? Fantastic, eh? almost everybody, great. Uh, the exhibit showcases some of the amazing marine fossils that we have in our uh, collections here at NHMLA, not all of them, just a few. Uh, but they tell the stories of this amazing time in Los Angeles history when animals like walruses, whales, even a giant megalodon uh, shark would have swam above our heads. Now, in order for us to learn a little bit more about this exhibit and that history, we are going to talk to these uh, incredible scientists here next to me who are going to go ahead and start things off by telling me, or telling us, rather, uh, if you were to wake up tomorrow morning and be an aquatic animal, extinct or extinct, which one would you be? And with what? Wow, uh, <laughs> that's a really good question. Uh, I'll be maybe uh, a stellar sea cow. Uh, unfortunately, they're extinct, but they were the largest sea cows to live ever in our oceans. They were especially as kelp eater. They're very weird. You know, that it was my question, my answer too, by the way. I mean, the majestic sea cow, I feel like, is the correct answer. Uh, awesome. I, I really thought you would have gone on a different story, right? Some of the scariest creatures to learn actually water this woman now that I would be an Ammonite. I would be the giant to an Ammonite. Ammonite, fantastic. I think you're right, it is. <laughs> All right, Alan. Uh, well, I 
was just upstate uh, up the coast and uh, was delighted to like see a whole bunch of sea otters around the world there. So I guess I'd go to sea otters. Sea otter, it sounds pretty good. Very uh, cute uh, videos online, and I'm hoping they end anything like that. Right. Um, but the correct answer was uh, Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, this exhibit, like I said, uh, just showcases some really fantastic uh, fossils from our collection. But I think it's important for us to lay the groundwork and really understand uh, how we know that Los Angeles was underwater. And uh, I think I'll, I'll ask you, Austin, since uh, uh, Austin is the collection manager for Invert Paleontology, and each, there's one exhibit in that, uh, there's one fossil in that exhibit which is, has such a fantastic display. It's the Ammonite fossil, like you mentioned before, which I believe is the oldest uh, one there. So that would be the oldest fossil we have on, on display. Right. Yeah, so that's about 80 million years old, that specimen. And, and I love it. It's a local, it's a giant Ammonite. Uh, it's not completely preserved, so the real specimen would be even larger. And uh, if you come to our, our table and foyer today, you'll be able to actually put together what the, the living animal would have looked like. So imagine that, that fossil shell, but with a squid sticking out of it, with long arms and tentacles. And you can see that shell right here on the, the yeah. table. Yeah. The actual fossil itself weighs 150 pounds. So yeah. this is just a little lighter. Yeah, now, now we've made some references that we can you know, spin on our fingers. Yeah. Yeah, so, the, so Los Angeles was underwater during that time, but how do we know that Los Angeles was underwater? I, I, we find these marine uh, fossils here on land, but how far back does that go? Like, how, what's the earliest that Los Angeles was underwater? No, that, that's a difficult question to answer. The, the oldest fossils we have in Los Angeles are around 19 million years old. But California um, has been underwater for you know, over a thousand, sorry, over a, a, a billion years, a thousand million years. Most of those rocks have been destroyed through the complex tectonic activities that we have in the city. Um, but if you go out to places like uh, the Harvard Desert, you can find fossils of that age. So, but the oldest record in Los Angeles itself is around 90 million years uh, in places like the Santa Monica Mountains and the CV Hills. And uh, Santa Ana Mountains in Orange County. Yeah, I believe we have some slides here. Can we go ahead and show yeah. a little map of Los Angeles? Yeah, so it's a map of Los Angeles County, Daniel. And, and what you see aboard the blue dots, um, that's the fossil record that we have in our collections. Uh, these are things that we, we have and we know where they're affected from. Um, and just the marine organisms. So you see the blue dots all over the map. From that, you can infer that. that you know, most of the county that we live in today have been underwater at some stage. The, the details behind each of those dots, the ages, and the, the types of animals, the environments they live in, uh, vary considerably. So it's a complex story. Um, but it is a, a place, a city, that is largely an underwater history. This was perhaps just 50,000 years ago. Yeah, um, we will, um, by the way, uh, for, for everybody's uh, benefit, we'll be having some time after the discussion to answer any questions you may have. And you will know, be able to go ahead and talk with our scientists later on uh, in the exhibit. Uh, this program is going to be about half an hour, like you know. And this is this, uh, great learning a little bit more about sort of some of these. Like, uh, why? Like, I assume that there's fossils that are not aquatic, but they, um, they're not necessarily that uh, as old as the, the specimens that we do have. Is that what you described? Correct. So, I mean, for, for many of us out there, you've been to Labrador Park, it's, it's an amazing place, uh, especially to have a fossil record like that and a, a, a museum in the heart of Los Angeles. Those fossils are, are pretty young. They, they represent the last 50,000 years, and they're all terrestrial. So that story, that, that rich story at La Brea is uh, has only happened in the last 50,000 years after the sea has retreated. Uh, up until that point, we were a very wet and, uh, and fishy uh, setting. Right. 
Now, it's, it's pretty difficult to imagine creatures swimming in, you know, like, the, or above the hills of, of Los Angeles and the Hollywood, like where the Hollywood sign would be, things like that. But why is it that we are not still swimming? Let's just say that. Like, what has changed in those uh, hundreds of thousands of, of years? That, that's, that's a good question and, and it might require a field trip uh, <laughs> to answer. But if we get to the next slide, uh, so, uh, you know, if you look around the city, um, there's a number of important features that we see. We see the mountains, the San Gabriel Mountains, the Santa Monica Mountains, places like the Palos Verdes Hills. Um, they are the result of that, that wild tectonic activity that, that this area has been subjected to over the last uh, 20 or 30 million years. I feel the next slide, right? so underlying those features is, is the geology. You can see just how colorful it is. Geologists love coloring in uh, maps. And the more colors and, and um, uh, the more complex those colors are, the more complex the geological story is. And so what's really going on here is, is with that tectonic activity, we've got a number of large faults and folds in the Los Angeles area, which at some points in time have sunk the area down. So we've, we've been a big basin, kind of like a your bathtub or your, your sink or a solid bowl. Um, fills up with water and sediment, preserving the fossil record. Uh, but then at other times, more recently, they pushed back together again and were popping up these hills and the mountains, uh, exposing them to erosion and weathering. And ultimately, to geologists like Jorge and myself, you can go out and, and find those fossils. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, the, the fossils that have been found are not just from paleontologists, like, like, like Corby isn't out there digging, digging up all those tiny little dots like all over Los Angeles. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more, uh, uh, Corby, about how some of these fossils came to be in the collection? Uh, so, the <coughs> fossils were found by everyday people, and these happen all the time all around the world. People uh, digging on their backyards, people, uh, people going for hikes, people going to the beach. Uh, sometimes, and one of the fossils we have on exhibit has a, has a really interesting story. It's a, it's a large whale skull, a species called Nicosicus elysium, and it was found in Nikon Heights by a plumber who was uh, digging a. Um, <laughs> I have a picture of it, and the exhibit photo, the first one. Yes, right. so we yeah. can see the skull right there. So, so this guy he was minding his book business, he was working, he was making this dish for, you know, an irrigation uh, um, plumbing um, for an avocado plantation. You know, we love avocados here in California. Uh, and he found a vertebra, and, and he had been to the museum. And because of this, he recognized that he had found something important. So he called out the museum, um, some of, some, some of the staff and they, they went there and they, yeah, they, definitely he had found something. He had found one of the backbones of this uh, whale. And they, the museum staff went there and within days they had dug up this huge, huge ditch and found a skull uh, that's about eight feet long uh, of this whale skull, the mandibles, part of the retiva photo. And they collected it and they, they brought it back to the museum. So, so this was a specimen that was, you know, the one who was just, you know, he could have just ignored it and kept working on his, uh, on his irrigation ditch when he did something. He made the correct call, literally. And put that to the museum. How, how big would that well be? So you said the skull's eight feet. The skull, yeah, so the skull's eight feet long. The whole body will have been about 24 feet long. And this is a whale that was swimming in, you know, in near downtown LA uh, about 11 million years ago. Just think about this. There was a fossil whale. Um, think about it more recently. There was a avocado plantation uh, near, near downtown. Um, nothing like, but it looks to the looks like today. Uh, so it just tells like one of these many, many, many stories of fossils discovered all around uh, LA County and then Orange County and other parts of California. 
So if you folks want to go today, uh, later on in your backyard and start digging up your, your jars there, you might get lucky, unlike me, as a child, who only found a broken toilet. <laughs> but apparently there are other things out there. Uh, so you, you, uh, your collection, of, uh, your mammalogy collection, um, it, 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 how many uh, specimens would you estimate to be in, in your oldest collection? Just mammalogy. We have a thousand and thousands of specimens. Uh, we can go the fossil, we did the collection of fossil marine mammals and modern marine mammals. We have one of the largest collections in the whole world. So you think about that very now this museum. Uh, as a researcher, of course, that fills me with joy because it means I can, I can work on a variety uh, of projects, not just me, but my colleagues and for my students. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole wealth of information we can um, bring out to people through your know, scientific publications, and communications, and museum exhibits. And we can tell the stories of animals that, you know, sometimes we think about them, uh, things like, for example, waruses. We can, we can go to the waruses slide. We also have some fantastic yes. uh, specimens here that uh, uh, Jorge brought out. Well, we're going to slide and make one point, and that is that Lincoln Heights whale, that was your first fossil whale in the Near yeah. But yeah, so it all started off with, with that one on the avocado plantation, now okay. the world's largest section. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, what are some of the criteria that uh, you look for to? Uh, why did you pick this specific specimen? In the so it, it, was a, it was a difficult choice. That's a really good question. So you know, we were looking for specimens that could tell either a story of discovery, like the like the Lincoln Heights whale, or a story of a, of a particular group that we that, like. It will never cross our mind that live here. Uh, for example, waters. If you know waters, if you know what, what they look like, this is just a gentle reminder. You know. It's, very large pit uh, Second floor of the museum, by the way. Come yes. On. Uh, with this very long puffs, something that are three feet long. But they didn't always look like that, and they didn't always live in the Arctic region. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. So when we look at the fossil record of waters, which goes, which begins about 17 million years ago. Uh, they're all around the North Pacific region, where you can look at all those red dust in California. That means that a lot of their prehistory is known from fossils that have been found and described in California. And LA County and Orange County are, are not, uh, are some of the prime places uh, where people have found fossils that can help us tell the story of, of how large this uh, began is. Yeah. And on the top of uh, your know, top left, that's a skull of Colin Warren. I got some water, but right? now it doesn't look like the iconic water. This is the skull towards the right, uh, with a big cuss, uh, kind of a big, bulky head. Um, ancient waters for a long time looked kind of like either smaller or larger versions of a California slide. Very much like, uh, so there's there's some things that we're trying to figure out about their, their shift in diet and habitats that um, kind of kind of drove this evolution, like this evolution of the made a lot of what they are nowadays. And these are fantastic, uh, these fantastic fossils can help us really get to know these animals and like start to figure out why they would move. Like they, like what has changed in the past hundred thousand years to actually um, not, you know, go out and see a walrus, you know, uh, in traffic. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. But these um all these stories of these uh, these exhibits uh, all the stories that these exhibits tell really wouldn't be possible without the amazing work that our uh, uh, husband Alan and his 
amazing uh, team of paleo preppers, or it's called fossil cleaners, have done to um, to create this fantastic new exhibit. And myself and Alan have worked together before. We've actually gone and dug up fossils in uh, New Mexico as well as done some prepping in the lab work. But I imagine finding fossils like dinosaurs and, and the work that you did for this exhibit is a little bit different. Um, were there any like surprises when you were you started to work on, on this exhibit? Well, actually, prior to the exhibit, uh, let's see, no, I saw the before. There we go. Uh, Jorge was just talking about <clears throat> walruses. Well, a couple of years ago, uh, we went out to the. Uh, we have a warehouse a couple of miles away, and the Berber Paleontology Department has out in that warehouse. Hundreds, at least around 200, maybe more, uh, field jackets that have been collected over the last 40, 50 years or longer. Many large museums have this uh, resource. And so, you know, you, we think about paleontologists going out into the field and digging things up. Well, sometimes these days, we go to a warehouse or into the collections to actually find things that haven't been. Uh, researched yet that haven't been studied. So Jorge looks through all the old records of the finds and says, oh, somebody in 1984, they dug this thing up and it looks like it had something in it. Let's go find that and pull that out of the warehouse and open it up. So we brought it back and bring it back to the museum here. And to the left there, this is a jacket. It's like about yay big. A jacket meaning you know plaster and burlap wrapped around to preserve the rock, which we call matrix surrounding some bones that, you know, just a few bones on the surface gave some indication to uh, a researcher that we should collect this. So we were going to, I opened up the top and I went down and I got, all right, can you take a look at this? And he looks at it and uh, should have highlighted it, but what we could see, he comes and looks, oh, there's a set of teeth over on this end and another set of teeth on this end. So there were two skulls and vertebrate paleontologists <laughs> and so, uh, so then me, myself, and uh, some of my volunteers spent a few months cleaning up those two skulls, called them the twins, Chang and Ang, or Paul and uh, Chumley. And uh, that's them on the right, that's them on the lower right, the upper right is someone else. Uh, but uh, the two skulls, and one of them, one of them's in the exhibit, and the other one is over here. So that's the twin of the one that's on the exhibit. So it's kind of unusual to find the two together. That was a, kind of a cool lab discovery story. Fantastic. Uh, and one of the stories that we talked about before, actually about the, the invert uh, collection, which is the, the, the ammonite that you mentioned over here. Uh, what, like, what were some of the challenges to bringing some of these collections uh, onto display? Uh, I know the ammonite weighed, what, what was it, like 100? 150 pounds. 150 pounds uh, shell. Uh, yeah, that's pretty, that's... And it, it, it's a great story. We love to share it with the public. But boy, I've, I've looked at that specimen too many times, and something had to happen. So this exhibit was a great opportunity to work with that one. I think it was the next slide when I was going. But we'll one after that. To, uh, to create some replicas of that um, which we could use both for our niche to see it and for the today, um, but also to support some, some um, artistic reconstructions. We're actually bringing that fossil to life with a, an artist, also in the foyer today with us. Um, and he'll be, uh, he'll be putting the, the soft body part of that animal into a shell. Hopefully we'll have that on display next year. Well, so, well, so what we have on display in LA Underwater is the actual fossil, this 150 pound, uh, 80, 75, 80 million year old anime. Uh, wonderful, wonderful fossil. But, uh, and in order to not overhandle that, you know, so the, one of the problems we have with fossils that they, is that they're sometimes both heavy and fragile. So uh, uh, we went through the process of molding and casting it the old-fashioned way. In another 10 years, we'll just be 3D printing these things. But still, this is still the best way to do it. 
And the only complication, the shape isn't complicated, but the weight and having to flip it over and, and uh, do both sides of the, you know, we're painting rubber on there, liquid rubber, and then uh, plaster and fiberglass shell, and then actually pouring the, uh, the resin. But this just goes to show, uh, and this was so that the mount maker, a guy named Scott, could use that instead of the actual specimen to build the, the mount, and then at the last minute, we swapped in the actual specimen. And now Austin and company have uh, a very fine, absolutely accurate cast. So when you go through you know, the fossil halls, and people often ask, oh, is that real or not? If it's not the actual fossil, we have gone to extraordinary lengths to make it absolutely accurate. And uh, so when you see those things, it may not be the actual fossil, but you can believe me, it's scientific. Uh, accurate, and it also goes to show the small army of people working on it. Uh, we have, you know, Colin, the artist, who did some recreation, and then our whole exhibits team, who mounted, who created everything in the show surrounding the fossils, all those cases, all the projections, all the lighting, and uh, they did an amazing job. Yeah, and I hope uh, people, when you walk into that exhibit, can feel. Uh, you know, the ocean kind of, I don't want to say vibe, I'm going to use that word, uh, around them. But that brings me to my last question uh, for our panelists here, which is, what do you hope people take away from this exhibit when they, when they go and when they leave? Ah, that's a very good question. So, of course. Kind of like the story of the plumber finding the fossil and contacting the museum. Uh, because, you know, we, a lot of times, uh, it's very hard for us to go out to the field to go explore and find fossils. But the key everyday people, uh, people who are going hiking often on their weekends, they can come across fossils. They're, they're like our eyes. They become our eyes in the field a lot of times when we cannot be there. And by contacting us with uh, your questions and photos of specimens, we can guide you to feel out what you found. So just, you know, next time you're out on a hike or you go to some of the beaches here where people sometimes find fossils, uh, have no doubt you can contact us and uh, we'll, we'll run up <laughs> our experts uh, and try to work with you to figure out what you found. So that's one, that's one of the main things I want to take from this exhibit. I'm going to piggyback off for and say everybody can be a scientist or participate in the scientific process. So that's essentially what Jorge is saying there, but, but you all have the potential to go out and make discoveries and be part of the process of, of science that we do here at the museum. But secondly, that the city that we live in, this wonderful place, uh, fossils can be found everywhere. From Malibu to Long Beach, Inglewood, Compton, uh, we have a rich fossil record in our collections. Uh, and we try to get many of specimens from all over the city in the exhibit. So I hope people take that away that uh, all parts of our, our town tell the story of Los Angeles and Port. And I, I think what I hope people take away from it is. The sense, you know, using this very local, I love that it's such a local exhibit, but it uh, shows us from something that you know, we understand is right under our feet how far back in time it goes. You know, paleontologists talk about deep time. So I hope you come away with a sense of, wow, you know, LA was underwater most of its history. LA wasn't even in California. <laughs> It <laughs> now, it was in Mexico when, you know, at a certain point, basically, so that, uh, you know, that sense of deep time and how the earth goes way back and, you know, it's going to be moving forward as well and uh, will continue to change and just to appreciate that sense. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, panelists. Can we give them a round? Enjoy Ben Fox, but first we're going to have an opportunity to uh, ask any questions for our panelists now. So if anybody has a question, they can go ahead and raise their hand. We're 
a small group. Please raise your hand and then I'll pass to you. We have about two minutes for questions, and then I know that um, we expect us to say a few words before. Oh, absolutely. It's fantastic. Uh, yes. How quickly did LA stop being underwater? I, I could probably answer that fairly quickly. Um, you know, right now, Earth, Earth is in a period of, of rising sea level for human-induced reasons. But there's, there's natural cycles of sea level rises and falls. And um, at the moment, they're happening every 100,000 years or so. Um, so the last, the last time the basin which is essentially all of that parts of our city uh, was underwater, fully submerged, was 125,000 years ago. And then it started draining, uh, the, the shoreline started moving towards the south and to, to the west, to its present position. Um, and that, that took place over the next um, 100,000 years or so, but really sped up uh, from about 50 to 20,000 years ago, allowing the Tarpis to be a terrestrial location, and of course all those amazing mammals and, and other animals uh, that have been found there be walking around and, and getting stuck in, in Ashtown. I love talking to paleontologists because for them it's like, oh, 10,000 years, uh, 50,000 years, that's real quick. <laughs> all right, we have some more questions. Fantastic question. Oh, yeah. How did things get started with this exhibit? That's uh, on here. Yeah, I think the exhibit was kind of a, a collected pandemic project. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, was very, uh, work, working from home. Um, I guess when some of our colleagues proposed this idea, they brought uh, several of us together and started these discussions. And, I think it's been like several months before we kind of like came to the, the finalized or almost finalized product. Um, yeah, it was our pandemic baby, yeah, sure. And um, you know, a, a lot of the stories were left on the cutting room floor. Um, but in a small space like that, it's hard to, to tell a, a, a cohesive story. There's so many things we can talk about: the geological history of this area, the evolution of all. Animals. But I think in the end, we settled on the best story, which is about the discoverers, the discovery stories, and, and the richness of the fossil record in the area. And, and for me and Jorge, I think it, it's a stepping stone into creating a, a permanent exhibit at this museum that really explores our, our ocean, uh, our relationship to the ocean, and, and how Southern California's uh, modern marine life came to be. Thank you. Great. Um, you had you had a question. Yeah, I was, thank you for our conversation. I feel the map now is not where I know it's there were groupings where you found the fossils. Yeah. I'm interested to see both why we saw so many fossils in the patterns and then why why we see gaps. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Probably best explained in Paris, if we go back to the colorful geology. There we go. Um, so, so most of the light color, the lemon color, there is the very youngest sediments, the youngest rocks, not even rocks, loose sand and gravel, that's come down the mountains from the San Gabriels, from the Santa Monica, uh, and it's not marine, so it's terrestrial. You'll find the occasional horse, bison, bone in there, but, but not particularly phosphorus. The marine rocks are largely underneath that stuff. So that's why the big gaps in the, the map dots, because you have to dig a long way down, thousands of feet places. We have concentrations of dots are where we have colors on this map, um, particularly the Palos Verdes Hills, Santa Monica Hills, the Simi Hills, the Santa Anas, um, and that is where it's been uplifted. So those places were underwater um, for, you know, tens of millions of years, but have only recently been pushed up and, and going up to a really fast rate. So the colors that is used, you know, it's, it's constantly rising. It's got faults on either side, pushing it up. 
um, and it's those in that, that rich fossil record. 